May the words of the lips and the meditations of our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Caesar and God. Caesar or God. Caesar versus God. Ministers pay taxes like everybody else. So the local pastor found himself at tax time sitting across the desk from his accountant. He shifted uncomfortably as the accountant shuffled through the various tax forms and documents and receipts. It was time for the final verdict. And as the accountant was explaining some changes in the tax law, he mentioned that the long and short of it was that it was time to render unto Caesar. The pastor, of course, knew exactly what he meant. So without any hesitation, he asked him, how much do I have to render unto Caesar? And although accountants aren't usually known for a good sense of humor, his head popped up from all of his paperwork and with a twinkle in his eye, he responded, as little as possible. And so the gospel passage today is that well-known encounter between Jesus on the one hand and the Pharisees and Herodians on the other. The story begins with a lot of flattery. Jesus, you're so sincere. Jesus, you truly teach God's way. Jesus, you treat everybody the same, and you're always so fair. But Jesus can see right through them. He's probably rolling his eyes as they talk. Because amongst all this honey is a stinger. And so they pop the trick question. It's a political question. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to the emperor or not? So here's the problem with that question. If Jesus says, no, don't pay it, it isn't lawful, we're Jews, not only are we not going to pay Caesar's tax with coins that have his idolatrous image stamped right on them, we're not even going to think about collaborating with the oppressive Roman regime. If that's Jesus' answer, then he's in big trouble for he would look like he's challenging the whole state. It looks like he would be advocating rebellion, and the Romans would be quick to act. But if he says, sure, go ahead and pay that stupid tax, what harm is there in a little bit of collaboration with the Romans? Then he will reveal himself to be a cozy, compromised collaborator and he'll look like he's caved in to the powers that be. So give one answer, and the authorities will round you up for treason. Give the other, and your followers will abandon you. That's the tricky part of the trick question. And then smartly, Jesus asks to see the denarius used to pay the tax. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't have a coin in his pocket? And it isn't, isn't it interesting that the Pharisees and Herodians do have the coin, as if they have already chosen the side of the empire? In any case, he asks about the image stamped on that coin. They tell him it's the emperor's. Jesus says, well then, give him what's his and give God what's God's. And apparently this is a great answer. We're told that the Pharisees and Herodians heard it 
and they went away amazed. But why? Why were they amazed? What did they make of Jesus' reply? What does it mean exactly? What did they report to the party bosses back at headquarters? Had they won? Had they lost? Is it clear to you what actually happened? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to to God the things that are God's. It's got a nice, pithy ring to it. It's easy to memorize. It feels balanced. It feels right. But what does it mean? And what precisely are we to do with it? And so, in answer, some theologians think that Jesus was talking about two distinct realms of human life, the secular and the religious, or maybe what some might call the church and state. And he's telling us that we are citizens of both of these realms, one foot planted in each. Earthly government is something we all need, and we're reminded in several places in Scripture that we should be good citizens of whatever state we are in. Our taxes pay for all kinds of good things that build a just and compassionate society, things like public education and universal health care and the fire department and good roads and chaplains who work in provincial jails, I might add. Who would want to harm those interests by refusing to pay their taxes, refusing to support such good things? But these same theologians might also argue that if the government becomes too oppressive or tyrannical and begins to demand absolute allegiance, then we have to give precedence to God, God's claim on us, or else we might all risk idolatry. We live in the state, but we also acknowledge the authority of God. And so we juggle our two allegiances. Sometimes we can accept the direction of the state. Sometimes we need to challenge it. War, any war, is a case in point. Every war raises a moral dilemma for Christians. Is violence even in the cause of good, even in a righteous cause, morally justified or morally defensible. And so, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what belongs to God. Another line of interpretation says that when Jesus told the Pharisee to give to Caesar what belongs to him, He was being a little tricky himself. The overarching truth is that nothing belongs to Caesar because everything is God's. Caesar has no authority over me. So when the state starts making ultimate claims on us, when, for example, the state claims that Caesar is God and should be worshipped, then the state is becoming blasphemous. A lot of people who like this kind of interpretation will often withdraw from this world so that they don't have to get mixed up with the state. The state is just a kind of imposter anyway with no fundamental legitimacy. And so they might move to communes or colonies. They'll avoid military service. They won't uh, sing the national anthem, they won't vote, they will probably set up homeschooling, all to minimize your involvement with the state, lest you be tainted by its ungodly corruption. Give to Caesar what belongs to him, and to God what belongs to God. And then there are some who feel that using this passage to think about our relationship to government just gets way too complicated. They give up 
trying to relate this story to politics or citizenship or government altogether. Instead of that, the story becomes a stewardship message. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, pay your taxes, support your country, but don't forget to give to God what belongs to God, so make sure that some of those funds find their way to Trinity United. You pay your dues to the country, you pay your dues to the church. Simple. So what does Jesus really mean? And, you know, my honest answer is, I don't know. And then I want to reassure you that that's okay. What is Caesar's and what is God's? Is my money Caesar's or is my money God's? Where is the dividing line between those two? Does the line shift given the circumstances, given the people involved, given the possibilities, given the contingencies? What happens when Caesar and God are in conflict? Is it okay when Caesar and God are in harmony? difficult and sometimes unanswerable questions, all of which highlights the tension in this reading, the tension in Jesus' reply. No easy answer is given. We're left not with a clear answer or with certain guidelines that we can use to follow in our dealings with the state or with the government, with the surrounding economic and political order. Rather, we're left instead with tension. Now, I realize that we want clarity. We like clarity. We keep wanting the truth about God. We want all the details filled in. We want the instruction manual. We want Jesus to tell us plainly who he is and how Precisely, we should look after our social and political and church lives according to the gospel. We want it all, of course. But the gift and the blessing that we are given is to see only partially, only a little bit of the light, only a little segment of the truth. And I'm becoming more and more convinced that it is a gift. It is a blessing. Because it leads us to a place of humility. And I'm becoming more and more convinced that humility might be our faith's saving grace in this day and age. Because most of what gets identified with Christianity these days are the voices that are not, apparently, the least bit perplexed or stymied by Jesus or by the God of Jesus. They seem to know precisely what God means and exactly how to practice what Jesus preaches. They are often willing to impose themselves on our pluralistic nation without the least bit of grace or humility. They seem unafraid that they may be presuming too much or overreaching. No shadow of a doubt or complexity haunts them at all. Now, I don't want to judge anyone's faith. I'm actually very eager for the good news about what God is doing for the world in Christ to be heard in the street and on the airwaves. I hope that I myself can always speak with confidence about the good news and never be ashamed of the gospel. But I also pray every day that I might be protected from myself, from arrogantly thinking that I know it all, 
from my anxious need to control God, from my presumption in thinking that I could dare to speak about God and for God. I want to follow the God and proclaim the God who refuses so wisely to be fully known. I want to be humble enough to live with the tensions of Jesus' teachings, the tensions of ambiguity. I want to have the freedom to say, yes, this is what is true, what is fully known, but also to say, this is what I don't know. This is what is mystery. And when I read something like today's gospel, which is so well known, but also so difficult to explain, I simply wonder if it should lead us exactly towards this kind of humility, the kind of respect for uncertainty. And at times like ours, with an authoritarian ruler trying to erase Ukraine, or with ancient hostilities surfacing once again in Gaza and Israel, with an oppressive regime systematically marginalizing the voice and power and influence of women in Afghanistan, with international politics shifting and realigning as we speak. I cannot tell you exactly what belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God. I can't tell you in every case where that dividing line is. All I can do is pray that God will grant you the grace to be permanently uneasy. And if we accept that, that tension, that ambiguity, that uneasiness, then perhaps Jesus would be very pleased indeed. Thanks be to God. Amen.